hundreds of people are sleeping in tents all across America, something that's been happening for years. And it seems as though we're stuck in a cycle. Every spring, every summer, we start to see more and more tents on unoccupied land, whether it's city-owned or state-owned. It doesn't matter. The tents, they start to form more tents come. A community starts to develop of tent residents. And then as fall and winter come each year, we can just about anticipate that city and state officials who have actually been helping to maintain the grounds by cleaning, providing waste management services, and even putting out porta potties for those who are living in tent encampments, those same people who have been helping the tent residents will come out with bulldozers and tear down the communities that have been created by those who do not have homes. And you would think after one year or two year or even three years of being stuck in the cycle, that maybe there would be some other solution that city and state officials could come up with the same resources that they're using to maintain these tent encampments, but they don't every year. And so here we are, it is September and the time is approaching where city and state officials all across this country are going to start bulldozing tents that belong to people who don't have homes. I want you guys to take a listen. I've been following uh, these tent encampments and the evictions or the closures now for a few years. Uh, I covered about a dozen tent encampment closures last year. And during dead of winter, I had the chance to speak to a woman who used to actually do outreach for homeless, but found herself without a job and in a tent. I want you guys to take a listen to how she described uh, how it felt to be out there while city and state officials were bulldozing her home. Yeah, they made it just look like sleeping bags and a tent. So everybody that's probably gonna see this, but that's actually somebody's home and somebody's bed and somebody's clothes that they worked hard for, all going to the garbage. Can you it talk is. about how you were treated today? I was treated just like every other homeless person was treated. When you gonna pick up and move, you know? And Bobcat showed up, literally, and stopped right here first, as if you don't see human beings standing right here trying to figure out where they're gonna go. Guy pulls up and says, come on, you know, we got a van waiting for you to take you, you wanna take me from here and drop me off where? Another street? And are you comfortable with um, just talking about how you ended up being homeless? You lose a job, you know what I mean? Lose a job. Um, no jobs out here. Um, because of my background, your limited employment, I had to jump through hoops to, to make ends meet, which I don't mind. That's something I accepted. However, I haven't been in trouble in years, you know? But that doesn't, that doesn't matter, you know? Where um, were you? working previously and was the job loss due to COVID? Well, part of it was due to COVID. Um, I'll outreach worker, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So even though I'm out here right now, it's, this is pretty much home for me. This is what I do. Can't even do this. Not because I'm out here with you know? So I understand, I get it, you know? And I've been speaking for my community for the last five years and it's falling on deaf ears for some reason. Yeah. You know what I mean? This, this is sad. Because a lot of that stuff over there is new, but where they just it's hard to hear a woman who used to actually be out here helping homeless people now homeless herself. That's right, Georgia. Um, good morning, and thank you for this reporting. I, um, you know, it's we need to hear more from the people who are the victims of this system, the people who are systemically left out. Um, and thank you for this, because hearing her voice as a person who has for years serviced the unhoused community and then to find herself um, in that same situation, it really speaks volumes about not only the commitment that the people have to each other, but it also speaks volumes about the abdication of duty from the government to whom we have given the consent to be governed. What are you doing with that consent? Well, we see now that they are destroying homeless encampments. They're not providing any type of significant resources to end homelessness. 
they are just trying to get away of the look of homelessness. You know, and being out there and and honestly trying to cover both sides of this issue, Ben, uh, and I, I think I left out, it's city, county, and state officials. Uh, and it usually depends on whose land, who owns the land. And that is the entity that will take the lead on dealing with this. But, you know, when you when you hear them, if they even make a statement, right, I always reach out for a statement. And oftentimes they decline to make a statement. They'll send some paragraph, right? But when one of the uh, pieces that I did went viral, it got more than a million views. All of a sudden I got a call from the mayor off the record. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to mm -hmm. talk on the record, but he put pressure on his administration for someone to speak with me. And so what I learned from their end was that they were trying to coordinate housing resources to put people either in shelters where they could also share a room because sometimes you'll see couples who are out here. And if they go to traditional shelters, they're split up and they don't want to be split up. And so they stay in a tent. Uh, you also have people, uh, we'll hear from one lady who talked about some of the issues in shelters where you have some people who have been physically or sexually assaulted. And mm -hmm. so what the city was saying was like, oh, we're providing storage units for people to store their items because you can only bring so much in the shelters. But when you go and you watch these closure happens, right. uh, happen right. with your own two eyes, what you notice is four huge dump trucks will be brought to the space and there's no U-Hauls. <laughs> <laughs> so how are things being brought to storage units when you witness everything being thrown in the trash? And so there's a lot of contradictions. What I will say um, when I covered the city of St. Paul encampments last year, I haven't seen new encampments this year. But in Minneapolis, the city of Minneapolis, when I traveled to D.C. for the March on Washington, there were there were tents everywhere in Portland, in Denver, in California, in Atlanta. Right. There right. are people yeah. living in tents all across this country. And so you you can you can shove people into a hotel for 90 days just to clean up the area and put fencing there so they don't come back to that location but it's not 90 days is a band aid. It is not solving the problem. And that's why right. each right. season we continuously see people back out here in tents. That's right. Um, and thank you for two, two winters ago in Atlanta, 11 homeless people died. Um, we all have seen the images of Skid Row in California. We have seen this all around the country. The insult to the injury is that while these politicians are giving us lip service, the truth of the matter is that they've done literally nothing to affect the homelessness population, which is a policy choice. And that's the main thing I want to say. This is a policy choice. We currently have more empty homes in this country than we have homeless people. This is a policy choice. The government, the people of Germany just voted over the weekend to nationalize 240,000 homes so that they can be used for purposes like this. It's not that we don't have the resources. It's that we don't have the political will nor the desire from the ruling elite to actually take care of the least of these. You know, I thought it was pretty innovative. Our mayor here, he he exed out our firework budget and reallocated those resources somewhere else, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, absolutely. City, county, uh, state departments absolutely have the resources. You could start with your firework budget for sure, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because and we're spending tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars simply just for entertainment. That's right. And what bothers me is in, in covering this uh, extensively, you know, you, you get the trolls online, and the comments about the people who are living in tents sometimes can be so inhumane and just totally lack empathy or compassion. If you've never lived in a shelter, you uh. you should probably do more listening than talking because you have no idea what it is like, especially if you're a parent and you have to bring your your children to a shelter. You have no idea what it's like to be told when to eat, when to go to bed, who can come over, who can't come over. And then when you're living now and sharing common areas like bathrooms and, and mm -hmm. where you eat with other people who have issues 
quite frankly. A lot of these adults are vulnerable adults, some who have mental health issues, some who have uh, addiction issues, but not all. Some people are just down on their luck and have just lost their jobs. But so you're dealing with a variety of people. I want you guys to take a listen. There was a man I had the chance to speak with uh, who was living in a tent. He was a, a younger adult. And I asked him, why is it that you don't want to go stay in a shelter? Take a listen at what he had to say. I don't like a shelter because you don't know what could happen to you in a shelter. And that's, I mean, you can see I am getting into a conflict in the shelter with somebody or something, or, and somebody can make a turn for something or something. You gotta share a bathroom with a whole bunch of people, and I don't feel comfortable doing that. So I like to be out in the open and just, use the bathroom in my, or like the tire, you know, Walmart or somewhere and use the bathroom. So I, I don't know, it's just, I don't like certain things that they have in there. So, I mean, that's all I'm gonna say. I mean, I won't want to be in the shelter. Uh. You know, I don't, I don't know what happened to him, but uh. something tells me that there's more in what he's not saying than what he is saying. That's right. That's right. Everybody, everyone, every person, every homeless individual, every un- unhoused individual has a story. They have a backstory. And if we do our part, they can have a future that is as meaningful as the rest of ours. I think what we have in this society is um, a hierarchy in our own minds where we, so long as there's someone underneath us, somehow or another, that's a good thing in this country. I want to suggest something different. How about we have no one underneath us and we provide opportunities for all of these people who are equally as brilliant if given an opportunity to survive this cruel system. Absolutely. Well, Ben, I know that you've been following a story this morning as well. You know, we're continuing to look at everything that's happening with our Haitian brothers and sisters. We're looking at what's going on in Texas and the response from the conservative party, the conservative movement, the Republicans. Um, and we also have some responses from uh, a black senator by the name of Tim Scott. And he has decided to insert, insert himself into the national conversation with regards to the asylum seekers that have now been deported from Texas. This is what this black man had to say about it. I want to also ask you about immigration. You didn't seem to have a problem when President Trump adopted Title 42, which allows for uh, those migrants crossing the border to be expelled without first being guaranteed asylum hearings. This was all justified under the pandemic. The Biden administration kept those things in place. Do you have a problem with what the Biden administration is doing with the expulsion of migrants now? I was for a strong border under President Trump. I'm for a a strong border right now under President Biden. When it comes to this question of the Haitian migrants, the the White House has basically said it's embarrassed about what has happened uh, in the past week and a half. Do you think that it's justified and what you have seen on camera with some of these thousands of Haitian migrants being forcibly expelled, some of them rounded up by men on horseback. Is what you're seeing humane? President Biden and his administration owns the crisis that they've created at the border, the humanitarian crisis that's unfolding before every eye in the, Amer- uh, in the American public. But it's the is, same policies under is the Trump administration. The treatment obviously is different. That's why his people have resigned from their post. It's the responsibility the of the president. For Haiti, you're talking about there. Thank you. The, it is the responsibility of the president to secure our borders. President Biden has not done so. The crisis of his own making looks very similar to the one that he made in Afghanistan, the one we're experiencing right now with taxing, the one we're experiencing with spending. This president should do a much better job of avoiding crises that are avoidable. Now, uh, just for a little more context, they're speaking of the retirement of the resignation of Special Envoy to Haiti, Daniel Foote, um, who just got the position in July, but has subsequently resigned uh, because of the treatment of Haitians. Now, Tim Scott is trying to spin it there and make it sound as though uh, the Special Envoy to Haiti resigned out of disappointment with the Biden administration over not having a secure enough border. And this is the angle that this brother decides to come in on when discussing the plight of our cousins. Anyone who is a survivor of slavery, a descendant of the survivors of slavery, the children of the diaspora are our cousins. And this black man has decided that Biden, whose administration swung in on whips, on horseback and whips 
and has deported all of our brothers and sisters, Tim Scott has decided to inject himself into the national conversation, this Republican, on the side of Donald Trump. Not on the side of what's just, what's right, and definitely not on the side of what's in the best interest for our black brothers and sisters from Haiti. You know, it is so interesting. I, I was reading the comments of some people uh, commenting on this story and on those photos of the whips being used on on Haitians. And narrative is so important because there were some people who, despite actually seeing photographs right. and in some cases like that one there where you can see a person being whipped, there are individuals who are still writing this off as though those are, you know, whips for the horse that they're just mm. they were just used for the horse. Yeah. And so, you know, we will continue to see people, especially on the far right, Trump supporters who will continue to deny the truth, even when there is video evidence of what is happening. And uh, the, the Biden administration, yes, uh, backsliding here on, on their policies that have really produced these outcomes. That's and right. so they need to address this head on and come up with um, real solutions for real human beings there's absolutely no reason why we had we're paying people to treat mm. other human beings this way that's right that's right that's right georgia that's it um and and since you put it that way i have to draw an analog with the police in our communities say i won't i need i need black people and uh as well as all people to understand very clearly that what we see happening dom uh, domestically is a direct reflection of what we do internationally. And the force that we saw used against our Haitian brothers and sisters at the border is analogous to the force that we're seeing in our communities. And we are literally, Georgia, we are paying people, whether they be police officers or whether they be Border Patrol agents, we're paying them to be cruel to us. And I suggest if we had a problem with no taxation without representation, then we should certainly have a problem with our taxes being used to abuse us. Yeah. And when we can make exceptions and room for other migrants, other right. people seeking asylum, when when this nation, when all of us are legitimately immigrants ourselves, unless we are indigenous, why is it that we pick and choose the people who we want to allow to seek refuge in our nation. Why is that? And, and why is it when there are people who have melanin in their skin? Why is it, it that we decide not only are we not going to accept them here, but we're going to treat them like they're animals. We're going to hurt That's them right. like they're slaves. Why mm -hmm. is that? And so I think the American people need to wake up. And this should absolutely be a wake up call for Americans in a similar way that George Floyd was a wake up call for That's Americans, right. that right. we have a serious, uh, deep in, embedded uh, problem of discrimination and racism that continues to show its face in every facet right. of our lives. And without a doubt, I need everyone to recognize that this is clearly an example of white supremacy enshrined in this country. This is a policy that was enacted by Donald Trump uh, under the auspices of protecting our border from COVID-19, even though the greatest threat to us was always within our borders as it pertains to COVID-19. But I need everyone to really, really understand that this is so emblematic of the structural racism that remains in this country. If you cannot see it very clearly on what's going on on our streets and what the police are doing to black people on every single block, then clearly you have to see the racism in this, the white supremacy in this, and how it is a consistent policy, whether it was Donald Trump or Joe Biden. You know, the last thing I'll say here, Ben, is they were just hoping nobody was looking. Yeah. They were just hoping there were no cameras pointed in this direction and that they could quietly do what they planned to do. That's right. And so as right. much as the media is criticized for, you know, spreading false information and, you know, the Fox news of the world. Right. This also I mean, the media, this shows exactly why it is very powerful. It's a powerful tool that can be used to document and expose truth, which ultimately then once you have it, you can use it to hold people accountable.
That's right. right. If, if, if this footage never surfaced, the Biden administration would never be confronted with the problematic strategies that they've implemented in dealing with Haitians who are seeking asylum. They would have been able mm. to just deploy their men on horses with whips That's and, right. and treat them like they were slaves they would have been able to do it without having to answer to anyone. But no, someone showed up with the camera. And so as much as there are issues with the media industry, there definitely are times like this that right. we need folks to show up with a camera right. so that we can have the evidence that is required to enact change. And right. uh, speaking of which, it, it reminds me of uh, Darnella Frazier. Mm. A 17 year old girl who was walking to the corner store who decided to pull out her camera phone and start documenting the murder of George Floyd. That's and right. had she not have done that, the Minneapolis Police Department, they issued a press release that said he just died from, you know, a medical complication while having an encounter with police. But when we saw mm. the video that Darnella filmed, we knew that was a lie. It did not That's add right. up to what actually happened. Right. That's right. Well, That's right. the latest developments, um, you know, I was in the courtroom and so I continue to follow uh, the Derek Chauvin developments with his case. And so he has been um, requesting an appeal. He's officially a filed for an appeal. This came uh, just a few days after another former Minneapolis police officer had his third degree murder charge overturned. And so I think Derek Chauvin is hoping for the same thing also because Derek Chauvin's third degree murder charge, uh, the, the legal foundation that was set was based on Noor's third degree charge as a precedent. And so now that that's been overturned, the legal framework and foundation has been removed. But we know Chauvin is charged also with second degree manslaughter and uh, another severe charge as well. So it might not affect his sentencing, but he did file for an appeal and he requested the courts to see him as indignant, which means he was requesting funding or a public defender. And so Judge Cahill approved on September 24th that he or uh, September 23rd that he uh, get five thousand dollars from the state of Minnesota for his appeal, for his legal fees. Wow. And. I did I did a story on it. I saw other outlets that were, you know, putting out there that he had filed for his appeal. But I didn't see anyone pointing to the court document that showed he was going to be getting five thousand dollars of taxpayer mm. money to pay for his legal fees for his appeal. And so uh, within 24 hours of doing the story, Judge Cahill reversed his decision and denied the uh, $5,000 that would go mm. towards his, his legal fees. Mm. Thank you, Sister Ford. Because to think about our taxpayer dollars being used for this type of savagery, because our eyes didn't lie to us. And God bless Sister Darnella Frazier for being the one who helped, who was the media in that moment, who captured the video of, 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 of Derek Chauvin cruelly and savagely um, murdering our brother George Floyd. Here's the thing to support. We're at a, a, a inflection point in our country, whether or not this country is going to recognize that it is and has been for some time carrying out the exact same uh, abuses that literally founded this country. If we're not going to be able to hold the police accountable and if this system is structurally incapable of giving us justice, then how are we any different, America? How is how are your police agents any different than King George's redcoats who literally led to that abuse the police state of King George led to the American Revolution now here we are paying these police officers to abuse and kill us and then they want to throw insult to injury by giving him money taxpayer money for an appeal so thank you for that reporting because no one else you're no one else was reporting it and um and I like to believe that your reporting directly helped stop this travesty you know, I would, too. And that's it requires us to continue to pay attention to stay woke, as some people would like to say, you know, but it, it, it really shouldn't take that. We should have a court system that's founded on integrity, 
right? A court system that should be able to work for people like George Floyd, who are accused of a lower level offense, who should be able to just get their citation or their day in court and be able to be on about their life. But unfortunately, what many people continue to fail to realize is that is not really the system that we have. We have a system that will allow Derek Chauvin to keep his knee on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. And now the little justice, the little accountability that has been brought forth, we see slowly unraveling. That's right. That's right. And I believe that's the point. Because if the system actually ever holds its police state accountable, well, then they have a little problem on their head. Because the leading edge, the tip of the spear for this system is the police state. That's how they protect everything that we see around us. This is how we're, they're able to get away. It, it, police are sent to destroy these homeless encampments. Police, they are sent to clear out protesters. Police, they are sent to patrol our neighborhoods. And, and, and we really must understand how. We as people do not have to tolerate the abuses from this system, whether they be structurally like this judge trying to give Derek Chauvin five thousand dollars or whether it be structurally in the form of them being on our police, on our corners, policing us abusively. We must honestly never apologize when we stand up against this police state. And so many people interpret that as being anti-police when it's really anti-racism, anti-hatred, anti-discrimination, you know, and and really pro. Like for George Floyd, in a way, it's pro system. Why couldn't the system work for George Floyd? Why couldn't he have gotten a citation for the accusation he was faced against for having a fake twenty dollar bill? Because when you when you go to law enforcement agencies and you ask them, hey, if I have a counterfeit twenty dollar bill, what is my punishment? What happens Mm. if I'm caught? You know, and it's certainly not the death penalty. It's certainly Mm. not. And so we we have so much transformation that needs to to happen in this country and whether that's reform or abolishing and creating new the people will decide that but what we do know is the other three officers i've been getting this question a lot when is their trial well the other three officers are facing both state and federal charges so the federal trial will happen this fall i believe coming up in november the state trial will happen march 2022 uh, and then uh Kim Potter, you may remember, was the officer who fatally shot Dante Wright. And so her state trial will be held in December of this year. So these officers are going to be on trial. I know Chauvin and the other three, they all pled not guilty to the federal charges. I'm not sure what type of evidence the Department of Justice has against them, uh, but maybe the Department of Justice launching this investigation into uh, Minneapolis Police Department, as well as Louisville Department, they're investigating. Yes. And there's one other uh, department they're investigating. Maybe these federal investigations will lead to substantial change. Mm. Mm. That's that is what we certainly can hope for. And that's what we're fighting for. And that's what we're going to be diligently using our platform for, because if not, then why are we here? Georgia, coming up, um, I know we're headed towards the end of this segment, but coming up at 840, I'll be speaking with Pascal Roberts. He is uh, an attorney, uh, lawyer, a writer and form uh, of the Black Agenda Report. We're going to be digging in a little bit more into what's happening on the border with our Haitian brothers and sisters. And we want to really flesh that out because we want to make sure that everyone understands that what happens to uh, the children of the diaspora is a direct reflection of what's happening to us as black Americans. Keep it here for that and more on The Benjamin Dixon Show.